recording. Hello, it's already the seventh lab. It's a bit difficult uh, for, <laughs> for me also to, to count all this with, with all the, yeah, I mean, not you here and uh, all the different types of Q&A we have in between. But uh, this is lab number seven and uh, the topic of today is motors, especially the servo motor which you have in your box. Originally I planned to also include the OLED display, but I think everything like that fits better into a separate lab next week. Um, so yes, uh, the instructions are on Studium and uh, it also says that it will be about motors and stepper motors and here's our microcontroller board as a reminder where all the different pins are and uh, what the functions are. We will be using PB5 today here, pin number 7 on the left side. We will need to connect something to plus 5 volts um, up here on the right top and ground. It doesn't matter which ground pin we use, but you will see that um, later. So in the end, there is actually a task for you, a homework. So I, I didn't put up any quizzes or so because I don't know actually how I should evaluate uh, your activities and participations in the previous labs. But uh, for today, actually, my plan is to give you a homework and uh, you submit the code which you come up with. There are plenty of different ways on how to achieve this function which I'm asking for. And uh, you have all the pieces from today's lab later on and from the previous labs. So it's just to put everything together and make it work, hopefully. To show you what the goal is, and I will actually um, rip it apart then uh, when we start connecting our stuff this time ourselves. So what you see here is the final setup. Um, we have our microcontroller here. We have the servo motor here. I put a paper in between so that you see the arm better. You might have seen if you unpacked everything, there's a small bag of different arms which you can put onto the motor axis on of the servo motor. Here is a bunch of LEDs and here is our potentiometer. And what does this thing do? Uh, by, by the way, here you see a microsecond display. We will see what this means later on and uh, well if I turn the potentiometer you see that the motor is following what I do on the potentiometer and also the LEDs are following what I'm doing. So if I'm moving the potentiometer to the far left the motor arm is in the left position and the leftmost LED is on center position is about here and then the far right position of the potentiometer corresponds to this position of the arm and this of the LED. So you have a mechanical indicator and you have an optical indicator and they are all working together. And uh, the question is how and how can you do it? And uh, I put up the assignment on Studium. You have until next Tuesday, I think it was Tuesday, 9th? No, next Wednesday to submit your solution. You can work in groups if you want to, and uh, but please everyone submit, even if it's the same code, submit the same code. And uh, you don't have to record it, you don't have to possibly build it, but of course it's, it's better to build it. You have all the parts and yet then you see that your, course, your code is actually working. Um, you don't have to print this on the screen. Um, that's optional, but uh, what you see on the breadboard is what I want you to build up. And uh, so to start over for, for today's lab now, I just rip everything apart. Here we go. Oh, the motor, I, I let the motor sit. And also the LEDs, um, I will not rip off. I will just not use them anymore. So back to zero. And uh, 
I recorded this before as well. So in the assignment, you have a link to a YouTube video, um, which I've seen that uh, seven people have already watched it. Uh, so um, there you will see the demonstration of this as well. So what are we going to do? We are going to connect the servo motor. And since I glued this one to my board, I will grab another one to show it. So this is how the motor looks like. Um, there are three wires attached to it, a brown, a red and an orange. The brown and the red is the supply voltage. And yes, I know that you don't see the motor. <laughs> Here it is. Um, so the brown and the red is the supply voltage. We connect these to plus 5 volts, not to the 3.3 volts on our board, but to 5 volts, which we also have at the uppermost pin on this side here. This is directly the supply voltage from your USB connector and uh, the motor will probably work at 3 volts as well, but it, it definitely works at 5 volts. And uh, then the metal part here is actually the motor axis. And this is a typical hobby servo, which you will find controlling rudder positions in uh, model ships or, or RC cars. What does VB stand for? VB stands for bus voltage. Uh, so um, it's the USB standard nomination for it and then yeah so it, it says vb in short on the board um that's also partly because i only have limited space i had about two characters uh, uh width here to to place text on the board so um but it's this uh, pin up here which i'm talking about um so this is a hobby servo but these servos same principle come also in slightly larger versions like this one here and uh, here you see actually a little bit of the construction of such a servo motor um, this is the output axis the turning axis and on the axis there is a potentiometer mounted which actually measures the current angle of the axis and then there is a controller with a feedback loop which actually makes sure that the um, axis is at a certain position and uh, it's called a servo because it follows the commands of a different unit they come even in bigger versions here i ripped off the uh, potentiometer already so this is just the motor and the gearbox um, i will later also show you other motor types which you don't have in your box. Um, but uh, let's start and focus on the servo motor. So how do we control a servo motor? These servo motors were constructed originally for radio controlled um, models. And uh, even in a time before everything went digital. So here we have the description of our MG90 Tower Pro. Actually, we have an MG90S. I don't know what the difference is. And it says something down here about a pulse cycle and a pulse width 400 to 2400 microseconds. And uh, so the motors are actually controlled, different direction here. Um, they are controlled by pulses by pulses which repeat at a certain repetition period, pulse period, and they have a certain width. So this looks exactly like our PWM pulses, doesn't it? Um, a one millisecond uh, long pulse is normally accompanied or corresponds to one extreme angle of the motor rotation and a two millisecond long pulse corresponds to the opposite. Um, angle. So these are not continuous rotation motors. They only can turn um, something like 180 degrees. Some of them can rotate 270 degrees. Uh, when the motor is not connected to the supply voltage, you actually can, should be able to, can, uh, slide. yeah, you, you can turn 
the axis and you hear the gearbox uh, squeak inside <laughs> and uh, so this is what the motor on the inside does as well it, it just turns from the other side on the of the gearbox and you, you see essentially this, this has slightly more than 180 degrees but we will see we, we cannot reach the extreme angle on on this side for for some reason um, but this is how it works and so how can we how can we control it or, or let let me first show you also the insides of such a servo motor we have a small dc motor we will talk about different other motor types uh, after this first code piece we have a potentiometer we have a small control chip which sits down here which nowadays is actually a microcontroller previously there was actually a series of analog integrated circuits which would do the work but I assume that actually a microcontroller is cheaper and more versatile nowadays and then you have the gearbox up here and uh, that actually then attaches to the servo arm which you put on top of the outgoing axis and so this motor the, this control unit receives pulses and together with the current position, which it knows from the potentiometer position, it will then turn the motor to the corresponding position. And if you try to get it out of the position while it is still in active control mode, you will see that the motor is fighting against everything which you try to do to it. The motor which we have is slightly better quality than what I usually had in this course. This actually has metal gears and uh, this means that it's very powerful and uh, probably not destroyed after single use, which some of the cheap ones with plastic gears are. And uh, I guess that's good. So, yeah. What can we do? Uh, first, we will connect up or well I will not first connect up the, the motor but I will look at the code first um, but we need to create pulses let me take a piece of paper we want to create pulses and, and now comes the data from the data sheet which actually says that the shortest uh, ones should be 400 microseconds and the longest ones should be 2400 microseconds according to the data sheet actually i found out that my motor tends to block itself here when i go above 2200 microseconds so we want we will uh, restrict ourselves to 400 to 2200 microseconds and uh, then this should be repeated every 20 milliseconds or 20,000 microseconds. If the repetition stops, then after a short time, the motor will leave the control loop and will be freewheeling or idling. And uh, that actually, then you could turn it. Um, so the idea is that it should continuously get this pulse train telling the motor at which position it should be sitting or standing or yeah and uh, the first code which I prepared for you is actually um, just a spaghetti code which will use a delay function because we know that we could actually use delays to actually make these pulses so we could have and and that we we previously used the delay millisecond function which waits a certain number of milliseconds there is also a delay microsecond it's a u because there is no mu allowed in standard C and most uh, people in the world don't have a mu on their keyboard unlike Swedes who have a mu on the keyboard um, so we will use the delay microsecond function both of these delay functions have one disadvantage for our purpose though and this is that the argument which tells the compiler or which, which tells the microcontroller 
on how long to wait, it has to be known when we compile our code. Because it's not something which is evaluated during runtime, it's something which the compiler evaluates and then puts in a certain piece of code which will take a certain while to execute. So we have to know how long we want to wait, but we want to make pulses of varying length. And uh, my quick and dirty way around it, which I use, is actually to have a pulse function. It's truncated, isn't it? Um, now you see, should see everything. Hard to see here if you see everything. Um, it takes an 8-bit unsigned number, which is the pulse length between 0 and 255. And then it goes for this number through this loop here. And for each bit in pulse length, it waits 10 microseconds. So if we want to wait 100 microseconds, we would have to go 10 times through this loop. If we want to go and wait for 400 microseconds, as we want for the shortest pulses, we would need to go 40 times through the loop. And for 2200 microseconds, we would need to go 220 times through the loop, which is in the range of a uint8, an 8-bit integer, which could actually go up to 255. So we could wait 2550 microseconds if we wanted to. And before we go into the loop, I set the port B pin 5 to a logical one by using this OR and the shift operator here. And when we leave the loop, I will clear this bit, this bit by actually using the AND operator, the NOT operator and the shift operator. So the second part here will clear the bit and this will set the bit and this will start the pulse and end the pulse uh, correspondingly. So the complete code you can find in the, yeah, not in my LaTeX source code of today's project, of course. Um, I didn't want to click there, but uh, I wanted to get here in the file lab07code01.c. It will include the um, USB libraries as well. So we have to include these as well if we start with a new project. Um, look back in how this was done if you haven't done this before. I have also included an init function and then here we have the main loop. And let's just see what this code does in its current form. So I copy it and somewhere I have AVR Studio. I paste it and let's have a look in the pasted code. Yes, it's truncated. I go to laptop shared instead, which is not truncated. I have a truncated view of my laptop screen and an untruncated view because I can this way remove a black margin which shows up at my re regular PDF files otherwise. So I include the library, I define the CPU frequency for our compiler to be 8 megahertz. And uh, then we have the pulse function, which we just had a look at. And then we have the init function, which makes sure that PB5 is an output by setting the corresponding bit in the data direction register. And uh, then we have the initialization of the USB communication. And uh, then I define a global macro variable here, it's a constant, it's a macro, um, step size 10. Uh, we will see in a second why I did this. The variable i will be my pulse length. So I start with it being set to 40, which corresponds to 400 microseconds. And I have a second variable, which I call up because you will see that in the loop I'm counting up and down and in order to remember whether I should be counting up or down I need another variable and so I used another variable here and I have a text string as an output buffer for sending text over the USB. 
And then we have the init here in the main part and then we have our infinite while loop. And there is a little bit of spaghetti code down here which can be programmed completely differently. There's as usual uh, different ways of doing this. Um, I used spaghetti code for visibility. I'm printing out text and this is very similar to the text which you already saw on the screen before uh, when the other project was running and this is I put out the text pulse then I put reserve space for the variable 10 times i to be printed out here and then microseconds and then a new line and then I send this through the USB to my computer then I invoke the function pulse with i as the argument as said before this will create a pulse pulse of length 10 times i in microseconds and then i will wait the 20 micro uh, 20 milliseconds sorry 20 milliseconds which according to the specification of the servo motors should be before the next pulse starts so actually this is not an exact number it doesn't have to be exactly 20 milliseconds slightly more is okay a slightly less is also okay it should be in the range of 20 milliseconds plus minus 10 milliseconds or 5 milliseconds or so um, rather longer than shorter uh, but uh, it, it's quite flexible so you will see that the, I'm, I'm not keeping the exact timing here because after these 20 milliseconds now I go into the if sentence if we are up counting then I increment i with the step size and if I go over the top of 200 which I set as a limit here then I will set i to 200 and instead go and set up to zero which means from now on it we shan't, should count down and uh, if we are already counting down then I will decrement i with a step size if we are going below 40 then I will set i to 40 and go up again so in this way we, we should see that we get longer and longer and longer pulses or in this direction longer and longer longer pulses until we reach 2000 microseconds or 2 milliseconds of pulse length and then we go shorter again until we are down at 400 microseconds and then we go up again to 200 microseconds and down again and we do this in steps of 10 uh, so in steps of 100 microseconds let's see what this does so I compile the code and uh, we have a code size of 3308 bytes and we use 28 bytes of data memory in total um, actually not in total this is only the global memory usage because inside our main we use 30 bytes only in in this string alone so um, yeah don't always rely on the data memory usage given here because this is only global memory usage and uh, so code is finished so let's upload the code or connect the server first I like connect the server first so I transition you here and now you see that uh, the servo connector itself it's a so-called female connector and we have these standard jumper wires which we have been using so far these can be used and just put in to the connector in the same way that we use them on the breadboard itself and uh, then we can use these wires to connect everything to our breadboard so the black wire is the brown wire it is minus and the red wire is plus 5 volts and the servo motor immediately did something here and I have already this yellow cable here which goes from PB5 to this column on the breadboard and the reason is that I want to connect the oscilloscope as well and show you the pulses which you are generating so I'm going here and 
well um oh yeah it, it's stuck now because i didn't upload the new code did i this is still uh, random numbers now actually it's not so random it's probably let me see what you see um it's 400 i can influence this by putting my finger onto the adc pin here um 20 milliseconds uh Teja. uh yes no i'm not completely sure <laughs> I'm, I'm not completely sure what it would do if we sent more pulses um the standard says don't and we don't have to <laughs> you can experiment a bit with it um okay so now the code is uploaded and and is it uploaded oh yeah uh, <laughs> the co code is uploaded and this is this is a very common pitfall um be aware of this i i not only now but it has happened so many times to myself and to students um i'm wondering why the system is not doing what i expect it to do and this is because i just uploaded the hex file of the solution to your homework uh, once again because that was still here um, selected of course then uh, it doesn't do what I wanted to do or what I expected to do so let's try with the correct code and here we are um, here we are we have made a windshield wiper Or, or a uh, something a, a bot which waves to us whatever you Im your imagination uh, says so it runs from one end to the other and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and we actually can see the numbers uh, crawling up and down here as well so this is the pulse length which our program at least believes it sends to the motor um, the third wire of the the third wire of the motor is actually the control pulses. So these are actually the pulses, the PWM signal. Um, this these pulses here, which we send to the motor, which then the electronics inside the motor. So this is not just a stupid motor; it contains a chip somewhere. On some of these, you actually could see the chip. Um, if you look into the gray transparent plastic from the side where the cables come out you can see that there is a small circuit board inside and on there is a small microcontroller which receives these pulses and turns the motor into the corresponding orientation if i connect the oscilloscope then i can show you these pulses which we are generating on the oscilloscope yellow wire here eh. no i use a white wire because it's short it, it was is more easily accessible zoom in a bit and wait a sec i i will just move everything more clearly for you Uh huh. Okay, and I can move. Wait a second. I'm I'm with you in a second here. Uh, I want to have a filter on the triggering. I want to have low pass filtering on the triggering. Yes, this is nicer and move the curve a bit to the left here and move the starting curve there and move the end cursor here and we see that this is now 1.6 milliseconds so follow me to the scope the yellow curve shows you the pulses which we are sending to the motor 
by manipulating the value in uh, on, on PB5 on the pin and uh, this is then the input signal which tells the motor in which position it should position itself. Uh, so the shorter the pulse we go to one extreme side of the motor and the other we go to the other extreme side. The supply voltage to the motor is on all the time. So it all it's always connected to the plus 5 volt from the USB bus. But depending on the pulses which we send it, the motor will either go to the extreme left or to the extreme right. And uh, we go back to the view of the board because we can test this. We can modify our code a bit. Eh. And for example, so can we, we, we can let it move slower. And uh, if we look in the code, the step size here determines how much I increase I every time I go through the main loop. So every time we go through the main loop, our pulses get 100 microseconds longer until we reach 2000 microseconds and then we go and make them shorter again. And if I reduce the step size to one, where's my step size, to one microsecond, then that means for every pulse which we generate, uh, we will get a pulse which is one microsecond longer than the previous one or shorter than the previous one. And this means that it takes uh, 400 to 2000 is 1600. Uh, it will take 1600 turns through the loop to go from 400, which is a start value, no, 40 to 200, whatever, we will see. Um, it will be 10 times slower than what it is now. And uh, we compile the code. I transition you over here while I upload the code. And uh, now you see how it's slowly moving from the extreme right position to the extreme left, passing through the middle. And we can actually, if you play back this video in slow motion later on, you could actually see which numbers here on the screen correspond to which position of the motor axis. And uh, But you see that they get larger and shorter. Wait a second, where's my tower time? I want to see these numbers as well. So now we're at 400 and now we are back at 2000 and now we go back to uh, 400 and back up to higher values. Um, it's hard with this simple code to make it slower. Uh, but uh, well, this is so what, what is the disadvantage of the code which we have now? Um, it does what I want. It turns the motor axis by actually setting the pulse lengths. Oh, um, actually I will show you how the oscilloscope image looks like because that's actually also a bit more steady now. Um, so here you see how the pulses get longer and shorter again. And longer again and shorter again. And where is the next pulse? Let's see if I change the time scale on the oscilloscope. Here it comes. So here you see um, one pulse and here you see the next pulse. If I show you everything here on the screen, you see one, two, three pulses. The time between these pulses is roughly 20 milliseconds. And the pulses themselves are between one and two milliseconds long or 0 0.4 and two milliseconds 400 to 2000 microseconds what we can see also in the slower moving servo motor right now is that it doesn't move the full 180 degrees um, it start it stops a bit short of 180 degrees here so um, you can fine trim this by actually changing the values 
uh, in the code where it says when to turn. So here I set the upper limit to 2000 microseconds, 200 times 200 times 10 microseconds. And here I set the other boundary to 40 times 10 microseconds. Why did I use steps of 10 microseconds? Well, I, I wanted to fit everything into an 8-bit variable for no particular reason. You could experiment by making i an, a 16-bit variable. Um, then you could actually change your pulse function here to be a 16-bit function which then steps not by 10 but but one microsecond steps. Um, just remember then that our microcontroller is running at only 8 megahertz which means that one microsecond is only 8 instruction cycles long. So don't expect microsecond accuracy on this type of coding then. Um, but you could actually with, with 10 microsecond steps here, this corresponds to 80 instructions. Then actually the instruction before and after is negligible and, and yeah, it, it works. So what else could we do? So um, this, this is working, but what are disadvantages of doing it like this? Well, one disadvantage is of course that our main program here is not doing anything but generating these pulses because we have to send out a new pulse every 20 milliseconds and we have to make sure that this happens. And we are also busy during the creation of these pulses. In, in this loop here, we are busy for uh, two up to two milliseconds every 20 milliseconds generating the pulse itself. So our CPU is using 100% yeah, of its resources to actually generate these pulses. But uh, if we look at these pulses, they, they are nothing else than just our PWM signals, which we have worked with earlier, isn't it? So can't we use a timer and its PWM function to actually generate these pulses? And the answer is of course yes we can. Um, we can take a timer and let it create these pulses. How did the timer work and how did the uh, creation of PWM pulses? By busy, yes, this code is 100% blocking um, for those of you more familiar to computer science terms. Um, actually, I think I used blocking in the description in which I wrote in the lab instructions. Um, but yeah, we call it blocking if the CPU isn't able to do anything else. We could, of course, do things inside the loop, but we must always take care to actually be back for the next pulse and not to be busy with other things during the pulse. Um, so how did our standard PWM generation work? We have a time axis and we have a count axis on our, oh, there, there it is, um, on our timer. And our timer is counting up, going back to zero, counting up, going back to zero, counting up, going back to zero eventually. And we could create PWM pulses by actually having a compare value, an output compare register value here, where actually we would start a pulse when our, we would, let, let me just think a second. Yes, we would start a pulse when our timer goes back to zero and we would end the pulse when our timer reaches the compare value, which means that if we have a higher compare value, we will create a longer pulse. 
And if we have a short, uh, a lower compare value, we will actually create a, a shorter pulse. And this is all done by the timer itself, so we don't have to care about it. We only have to update the output compare register with the value of the pulse length. So what we now want to create is pulses which have a length between 400 and 2000 microseconds and which are repeated every 20 milliseconds. So from, from this graph here you see that my drawing is not to scale uh, <laughs> because this is one tenth of the whole time period. But uh, we will have a look after the break into the data sheet and see how we can create these pulses with this specification from our timer. In the lab instructions I copied the uh, necessary registers for timer 1 because we will need, we will see that we will need a 16-bit timer to get the accuracy and resolution which we need for this purpose. And timer one is, yeah, a 16-bit timer and actually all AVR microcontrollers. So uh, we, we also can have a look in the lab instructions. I'm trying to stretch out the time under the break which is unnecessary we can of course start the break earlier um, but uh, so you see that here on this side we have pins which are called OC1A, OC1B and OC1C as these additional functions on the pin and we have already used OC0A um, this function on this pin here last time when we used the timer zero to generate our PWM signals. But now we want to use timer one and I chose to actually use channel A of this timer for my example code and so as you see this is the same pin as PV5 so we don't have to reconnect any wires we can use the same pin but our goal is to let the timer produce these pulses instead of our software. And quarter, quarter past, we will see how this works. I need to get some water and then I'm back at my desk. And uh, yeah, if, if there's any comments, questions or anything else during the break, I'm here. Otherwise, we continue at quarter past.
put the recording here as well and uh, just give me a tiny second here to check tiny second here to check we go here just want to see if my code which i programmed here will be working i've never controlled these motors from this microcontroller before and there's definitely something with which ah ugh, stupid me um give me another millisecond here right with you ground goes here and then there's no room for vcc using cable from there so i use a longer cable from here to oh yeah okay i'm i'm very positive that this will work as intended but let's go back to our servo motor first so here we are at the servo motor and the question now was our servo motor needs pulses between 400 microsecond and 2 millisecond long each 20 milliseconds to adjust itself to a certain position uh, which is corresponding to the length of these pulses and as i said this looks pretty much like our pwm pulses looked also um, just showing you once again on the oscilloscope this is what we are creating right now so we are creating pulses which are getting broader and more narrow so this is pulse width modulation but we used spaghetti code for it oops camera got stuck in the lamp um, let me see if we are yeah it's about as focused as it possible to be focused and uh, so the the code for this i prepared already in the lab instructions as well so let's have a look here or well let's scroll down to this part of the lab instructions um, so we are now at the second micro project here oh um, i should have run latex one more time so that there wouldn't have been any question marks for the um, references to the figures but you will figure out or the listings you will figure out which is which um, so yes the the answer is already here and one answer is already uh, also the fact that i gave you again the register descriptions of timer one and as i said this is actually what we will be using so why do we need or why is it recommended easiest i don't know to use timer one for this purpose we, we want to have tens of microsecond resolution 10 microsecond resolution was obviously good enough before and we want to have to create these pulses every 20 milliseconds so our timer needs to run over or restart after 10 milliseconds wait a second wait a second okay um should have one button to mute both the recording and the zoom so well we we have seen before that we can have a timer run over like this when it reaches its top value which depending on the type of timer could be 255 for an 8-bit timer or 65535 with a 16-bit timer generally we say this is the top value here and uh, we have an 8 megahertz clock frequency in our microcontroller if we count with this 8 megahertz up to 255 
then this will take or this will happen 8 million divided by 256 it will happen 31,250 times per second or corresponding uh, to x to the power of minus 1 um, 32 microseconds so that is obviously short we want to have something which stretches 20 milliseconds and not 32 microseconds um, then we have the clock prescalers as well which we can use to actually divide this clock frequency by 8 by 64 by 256 and by 1024 um, these we have also seen previously uh, could be used but what happens if we take the 8 megahertz clock and divide it by 8 that would give us a timer tick frequency of 1 megahertz or corresponding 1 microsecond so every microsecond our timer would step up one step on this line here so the only thing there is a 60-bit timer in the MCU. This is timer one, and this is where we are heading. And so if we, if we use this, then actually we want our timer to run over at 20, 000, after 20,000 steps or 19,999, um, because we are starting from zero, but actually the one microsecond really doesn't make a difference up here. Um, but uh, so, is there a way to actually tell our 16-bit timer to not count to 65,535 but only to 20,000? Let's have a look into the data sheet and there is... We have seen that these modes are called uh, clear on timer compare before. So we have CTC here in the data sheet which would count to the value stored in the OCR NA register. Um, there's another CTC which counts up to the value stored in the ICRN register. Um, but we also have mode 14 here. And mode 14 says it is a fast PWM signal. What I sketched here was a fast PWM and it counts up not to 65,535 as it would for a 16-bit timer, but it counts to the value which we store in the register ICR. Um, and the register ICR is described somewhere further down. Um, OCR, 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 ICR. So we see it's a 16-bit register because we have a 16-bit counter. And uh, this means for us it's actually two bytes in memory, two memory locations. But our C compiler handles it as any other 16-bit number. So we don't have to care that these are two bytes. We use it as one register ICR1. This is the case for all 16-bit registers in the microcontroller. We can use them as a single 16-bit register in the created code for the microcontroller it will be two memory accesses one to the high and one to the low byte but for us that doesn't matter the, our compiler is smart enough to do this for us so if we have a look at the code let me open this in here again so like this we first go back to ah, wrong click no, almost. <laughs> Here um, we go back up to the code bit. Here in the init part of the code, I now include a setting for timer one. ICR one I prepared. We have to figure out what value you want to have in ICR one. And then we also want to figure out the other bits which we have to set inside the timer control register in order for it to give us this PWM signal. So if I copy the code so that we get the syntax highlighting, um, I copy it from here, 
control C and I go to Admiral Studio and I mark everything there was and replace it with a new code. Um, looking back to where you are here. We start again with the same settings up here. Nothing new. Um, the libraries which I include are the same. And uh, only now we have to figure out to what we want to initialize timer one. So we already said that it was probably mode 14, a fast PWM, fast PWM counting up to the value which we store in ICR, uh, red, in the ICR register. So mode should be 14. Then prescaler, I said that uh, it would not be a stupid idea to actually use a time step of a microsecond, which we can easily derive from our 8 megahertz clock frequency by dividing it by 8. And as we can see in the data sheet, division by 8 is possible. It's this setting here, so it's 0, 1, 0 for the CS bits. So we go here. Prescaler should be divided by 8 for 1 microsecond steps. And this corresponds to, yes, you, you don't see the slides. Sorry. Yes. Good. <laughs> I'm, I'm lost in my screeny world here. So I, I just added some comment here. We want a prescaler divide by eight for one microsecond steps, which corresponds to CS being this number from the table. And uh, so we look out where are the CS bits. They are down here. I actually have still a typo in this code. <laughs> I have this typo in this code since 2014 or 15. Um, it doesn't matter because it's the same bits, but it should be the CS1011 and 12 bits because we are working with timer one. But as you should know by now, um, CS12 is nothing else than a very fancy way to write the number 2. So this is just in order to translate easier from the data sheet into our code and back. Um, we could write 2 here as well, um, but we write CS12 and a 1 and a 0. So this is the setting which we need for the prescaler a zero, a one and a zero on the corresponding bit positions two, one and zero. And uh, then we said that we need mode 14 here. So let's have a look back into the data sheet. Mode 14, these are the WGM bits, number three, number two, number one and number zero. And we see that we want to have a 1, a 1, a 1 and a 0 to get this mode here. The fast PBM running until the value in ICRN. We could use mode 15 as well, but uh, we don't want to. Um, uh, the difference between mode 14 and 15 here is that the top value is stored in a different register. So ICRN, we, we are not using, and I've never used the ICR register for anything else, but the output compare register A could be used to generate PWM signals. Um, we'll have a look at, so the A register is actually the one which we want to use because we want to generate pulses on this pin here, and therefore we cannot use the OCR 1A register, but of course we could use uh, output C or B for our pulses and then we could use the uh, register OCR as well. So the difference is where we store the top value, um, the difference between these two modes. In one case it's stored in the register ICR and the other one is stored in the register OCR 1A, but we want to store it in ICR. Otherwise, the two modes are completely identical. Yes. 
and we could actually do something uh, we we could actually think of using a p a face correct pwm uh, with the top value here as well but this is actually more complicated than what we need to so we we keep it simple hopefully simple um so once again one 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 zero we want to store there uh, let's find my code again i lost my code window here um, so we want to have a one at the bit position three we want to have a one at the bit position two we want to have a one at the bit position one and a zero for bit position zero of the wgm bits and you see that they are uh, stored partly in tccr 1a and partly in tccr 1b so they yeah they didn't fit i don't know um i don't know the reasoning why they did it like this why they not store everything in the same register but uh, yeah i don't know there's two three three more question marks to figure out here uh, the one is so what value should we set into the ocr1 register and uh, looking back at my sketch here we want to count to we want to have 20,000 steps along this slope. So 19,999 would be a reasonable value for the ICR register. Um, as I said, 20,000 is also okay. We would count just one microsecond longer. Um, it really doesn't matter for, for these long counts. If you're only counting 10 or 11 steps, then you would make a 10% error. But here the accuracy is in the range of the quartz crystal accuracy anyway, so, so it doesn't really matter. So, but I, I write 19,999 into the register. So this means count from 0 to 19,999, then start over. That's for short what this means. And we want to generate PWM pulses. So we have to have a final look into the data sheet. And the pin functions is the first part of the timer register descriptions. They are stored in the TCCR1A register. We have two bits controlling pin A. We have two bits controlling pin B. And we have two bits controlling por uh, pin C. We want to work with pin A, so we have to look into these two bits. But the function is identical between the two bits and it's identical between these two timers as well. So here we have the function for a non-PWM mode, which is irrelevant. We have a PWM mode. Here we have the pass fast PWM mode. So we want to have a value from this table here. Zero, zero on the one and zero bit would mean normal port operation and that the pwm function is disconnected then we have zero one and there's too long text to read or understand i don't know i don't care <laughs> but we have these two options left here and the description is as exactly as long in both cases so we have to see what it says here it says clear on compare match set at top and here it says set on compare match clear at top so let's have a look again what we want we want our pulses to start when the timer starts over and we want the pulse to end when it reaches the compare value so we want to, we want to clear the pin at the match and set it at the top have a look clear on compare match set at top it's one zero which we want to have on these two pins or bits sorry bits so it's a one here and a zero here this now initializes the timer one to generate pwm pulses and now the only thing which we have to do is give these pwm pulses the correct length and this is done by the output compare register which is not initialized here um, 
And uh, so this is done in this line in the code here, where I set a value to the OCR1A compare register, which means I'm changing or adjusting the threshold value, which then defines the length of our pulses. So whenever we cross this line here, our pulse will end, which means a, short, a lower value in OCR will give us a shorter pulse, a longer value in OCR will give us a longer pulse. And we want to have pulses which are between 400 and 2000 microseconds long. So I actually set a step size variable here to make steps in 100 microsecond steps. And I start with the value I set to 400. So everything is scaled up by a factor 10 now from the previous code. The rest is exactly the same as the previous code. I have the up counting and the down counting part here. And uh, I increment i by step size. And if it reaches 2000 microseconds, then we set it to 2000 microseconds and start to count down the pulse length. And if we are reaching 400, then we actually set it to 400 and start counting up again. So this part is exactly the same. The only difference is now that I work with a 16-bit variable because we are now actually giving the exact length in microseconds. But everything else is the same. But now we are not waiting the 20 milliseconds between pulses in our main loop. So our main loop would be much faster and we can have a look how fast it would be. Um, so I added another delay here uh, of 40 milliseconds just to not make the code to execute too fast. But this could of course be anything else which you want to do in your code now because the pulses will be generated continuously. Whether we are updating OCR1 or not, um, it, the, the timer will generate our pulses. Even if we completely um, stop the code execution, our pulses would still be generated and our servo motor would still get its commands from the microcontroller. So let's compile this code and see if I made some mistakes somewhere. No? Okay, this looks good. Then let me find the correct avia do this. Uh, this looks correct. And I show you this, what's happening here. Double click. Program the new code. And well, apart from the fact that it's slightly faster now than before, the motor is doing exactly the same. Um, but trust me, this is now done by the interrupt service routine. Uh, not interrupt service routine, sorry, hardware timer. We could also do this in an interrupt service routine, but that would probably not be the best idea either. I will just show you on the oscilloscope. The dancing pulses are again, they, they look exactly the same. Um, they should be exactly 20 milliseconds apart now, because now it's independent of our delay and what else happens in our software. Um, these pulses are generated by the timer, by the hardware. We are just adjusting the lengths of the pulses in our software code. I will try to bring you back to the view over here. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> shaky, shaky. So, how can I prove to you that uh, actually that it is doing what I say it's doing? I don't know how I can prove it. Um, no, I have no idea how I could prove it to you, but it is the timer now which is generating the PWM pulses. And uh, what we can do is actually we can change the speed in which we increment or decrement the pulse length now. We could actually make a longer or a shorter delay here. 
let's say we wait for 200 milliseconds between steps. Will that be too slow? I don't know. No, I don't think so. So we're compiling the code, or I am compiling the code. I'll transition you to the screen here. When I press reset, the motor stops because now we are in the bootloader and that also stops the generation of the PWM signals. And now actually I see that the pulse length is changing, but my motor is stuck at the end position here. And I said that this sometimes happens. Um, not so good. This is the short end position, I think. Let's I disconnect the power, then I can actually uh, <laughs> I should be able to ah, <laughs> to unlock the motor by actually turning the arm by force. And yeah, so I, I don't know it it got stuck there. It, it sometimes gets mechanically stuck at one of the end positions. Switch off the motor by actually um, unplugging the power supply to the motor and then you can actually turn the lever here and then bring it back to the middle position and then it will work again. Um, if you do this with the plastic gear motors then actually there's a high risk of breaking the gears but uh, these metal motors say they, they should be completely okay with this treatment. So let me just look at the numbers which you can see here. I, I can read them, can't read them off your screen, but I see them here. So we see that it's 400, 500, 600. It goes up to um, 2000 microseconds and then back to 400 microseconds. And you see how the motor is now moving in yeah, slightly larger steps and fewer steps than before. But uh, this is only up to you and up to what you are doing in the main loop now. Um, okay, why is it not moving all the way to the left? Why is it not moving all the way to the left? A very good question. And the question is that this motor actually, and this is something which is some, I mean, these are not precision parts. These motors are, um, even the ones we, we have now, they are uh, worth something like uh, between five and ten dollars. And so there are no precision tools and uh, the numbers 400 microseconds and 2400 microseconds are not completely exact. So the data sheet of this motor says that actually the maximum pulse length which corresponds to the left position here is uh, 2400 microseconds. I have seen with particular this motor that if I use 2400 microseconds it will get stuck but we could go to 2300 microseconds and have a look if it brings us further to the left. Um, so I go into the code and instead of 2000, I set it to 2300 here in the if sentence and 2300 over here as a maximum value. And then I will now, yeah, I will recompile the code and we will see that it will move further and hopefully not get stuck. I had to, for, for the presentation which I made and in the filming of your homework solution. Um, actually, I had tested myself to the exact end position um, where I am still safe to reach as far as I could. But normally you would trim it in uh, somewhat with it. And then, then, yeah, okay. So actually running it to the full... To th yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it was too far. It's stuck on this side now and it's actually more than 180 degrees. So 2300 was too much. Um, let, let, let me try to actually set the start value to 450 
and the end value to 2200 instead. I should have gone the other way, of course, it tested not, not going from the extreme or to the extreme, but going more careful. Um, update the code. Program. New software is loaded. Motor is still stuck in this position. I will unplug it. I will move it to the middle position. I will re-plug it in and we are moving, we are moving, we are moving and we are stuck. <laughs> and we are stuck. Um, it's actually quite, a, because of the gear ratio, it's quite a powerful motor. So it, it really wrenches it into this position. Um, let's try 2100 instead. So. The values which I gave you, 2400, it's not a 180 degree angle, but it should be safe not bringing your motor into a stuck position. Um, and if it does, unplug the power, turn it by hand. And it, it, it overturned again. Okay. Don't know. Don't don't want to go there. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Imagine car wipe is getting stuck. Uh, so, so actually, yeah, it happens. Go, oh, go to 2000 and no further. That should be safe for your motors. Um, and then you don't get the problem of, of a stuck motor. What I wanted to show you finally, because the third project, which we have, I, there, there's a message from Teja in the chat as well. I'll have a look at that in a second. I just wanted to go and show you the rest of the instructions here. And uh, so the rest of the instructions is actually the third micro project is actually what is now described as your homework, which means connect the potentiometer. Yours doesn't look like this. Um, yours looks still like this. And we used it in lab five. So combine the code from lab five with the code from lab seven and actually make your servo motor follow the position of the potentiometer. So you turn the potentiometer and then the arm of the motor should follow the position which you rotate this to. So read the position of the potentiometer, the value of the voltage with the ADC in the same way it was done in lab five and then move your servo motor to this position. So this is should be quite easy to get combine these two codes but then I think you might have to think about the third part here to actually indicate where you are with these LEDs. Um, there is a ton of solutions you can of course always do it in spaghetti code um, but perhaps you can come up with a smart way to actually um, translate the value of the position into a position of the LEDs. Um, and don't be afraid if you if you're not managing i mean i i will reward every try but at least try to see and, and write this code um but for today what i wanted to show you then additionally to the servo motor is different other types Yes, you can use cage, cage or, or if else, and there is a ton of solutions. I can tell you, I didn't, I didn't use either case or if else, but uh, it's up to you. And I'm curious to see your solutions. But I wanted to show you different other motors, um, because I mean, motor control is a very broad field and very frequently used field for microcontrollers. And uh, what I have here on my desk is several other types of motors. I have here a DC motor with a gearbox. So we already had a DC motor and a gearbox here. Um, it's one of these typical building blocks which you buy for Arduinos if you want to have a small robot car running around. 
uh, it has an axle and then you can buy wheels which you can just shove on this axle and then you have a, a almost running car. Um, DC motors use a DC voltage to rotate and uh, I plug this into my DC supply on my desk here. So if I supply power uh, in one direction then the motor will turn in one direction and if I plug it in the other direction then the motor will turn into the, uh, in the other direction. And this is a continuous rotation so this can be used for wheels while the normal type of servo motors only gives you 180 degree, degree range and not a continuous rotation. But how can you control this from a microcontroller? And for this there are controller chips like this one here. This is a so-called H-bridge driver. And what is an H-bridge? And where does the name come from? Oh, it's making funny moves here on my desk. <laughs> so disconnecting this. An H-bridge consists of four switches, which are of course transistors. as all our electronic switches are. And we have the motor in the middle here. The lower side here is connected to ground or zero volts. And the upper is connected to the positive supply voltage for the motor. Eh, like this. And what the controller has now to do is to either close this switch and this switch which then will actually pass current in this direction through the motor and it will turn in one direction or close this switch and this switch and current will go in this direction the opposite direction through the motor you can also do things like braking the motor uh, by actually short-circuiting uh, both of these sides or both of these sides then the electromagnetic force in generated in the motor will actually work as a brake. Um, but the normal operation is that you either have current going through these two switches or through these two switches. And uh, there's a ton of different driver chips like this one which from the microcontroller will then get one connection which is on or off and one which is the direction of the rotation and so here we have the H bridge bridge driver and uh, yeah they're there for, for Arduino there are so-called motor shields which utilize these driver chips this one is good for drive for running uh, or switching one amp which is definitely enough for most uh, motors which you connect to uh, like, like this one here to, to a microcontroller. Another class of motors so this is a standard DC motor direct current Another class of motors which is increasingly uh, popular is actually the brushless DC motor. Brushless DC motor, like this. This motor has actually three motor windings, three electromagnets. which generate a magnetic field and the idea is that by switching these points to different polarities between plus supply voltage and ground you're creating a rotating magnetic field which then in turn will make the motor spin and you do this normally by using a triple half H bridge um, which means that you actually use the same configuration uh, as before 
So you have, but this time you need three switches on either side. And then you have the point A, the point B, and the point C. And you have the lower switches here. What makes the whole thing more complicated is that you have to know where you are in the rotation of the motor. And this can be done either by monitoring the induced electromagnetic force in the or electromotive force in these coils caused by the rotating magnetic field itself or you have external sensors actually registering where you are. This is actually a BLDC motor so you see this reconnections here on the back side and this is a spinning motor from a hard drive so this, this was rotating the discs in a hard drive uh, before this hard drive was thrown away and I then took out the motor. Um, they, they are very fun because they, they, these, these are spinning fast in, in a, even in a no normal uh, hard drive they would be spinning at uh, 5400 or more than one 7200 rounds per minute so they, they are pretty fast. But the third class of motors which you probably have heard about are stepper motors. And these are the key components in for example 3D printers moving the printhead in x, y and z direction. And these are actually consisting of two magnet coils in general. And uh, then you have the rotor which has a, <laughs> in a very simplified view, it has a north and a south pole and by actually changing the polarity in these two coils you actually create also a rotating magnetic field which will then spin the rotor. But these two coils they are actually not just arranged like this they are actually arranged and this, this is a stepper motor they are arranged in many fine uh, or I, I don't know these are I think these are 12 I don't know no this is one two three four five six seven eight nine eight eight so you have eight um, coils alternatingly the coil A and the coil B and instead of just having a single north and south pole you can probably see these gears in the inside. These are the individual magnetic poles on the rotor and with each changing of the magnetic field you are turning the rotor one tooth position in either clockwise or counterclockwise direction. And this particular motor used to have 200 steps per rotation which is actually quite standard. I have... Ow! My servo motor got warm. Um, I have another motor here which we used to use in the lab boxes when we had the labs here at Ongström. Um, I didn't include them because it would have been even more parts, too many parts and actually uh, Electrokit wasn't able to give me uh, these motors in significant quantities either. Um, they need a similar driver chip as the DC motor here uh, which is this one here but you have to create a sequence switching the magnetic field of these coils and I prepared a little bit of code before in the break and here the LEDs on this driver board actually show you um, the sequence in which these coils are activated. Um, you see that there is actually four connect or four LEDs here but I only drew uh, two coils here. This is because there is one option to actually connect the middle point of both of these coils to ground and then you have four loose ends to play with instead of just two coils where you have to turn the current around. 
and let me just see if I can really get this motor to spin and not only the LEDs to blink. So I will connect everything back together. And yes, it is spinning. Yay. Um, so actually I can feel it spin, but do you see it spin? You see it spin, Daniel. Okay, um, you have to look very careful because this this motor actually also has a gearbox and it takes 4096 steps for a complete ro uh, rotation. Um, but what I can try to do as the last thing for today is I will change the delay. I can put this code up for the curious as well. Um, I can actually take out the delay out of my loop here and then actually okay um, then actually it will spin. No the, sorry it, it will not work because then it's spinning too fast. I think I have to have at least 10. No one millisecond should be good. 1 millisecond, 1 millisecond, which gives us one rotation every 4 seconds or something like this. Um, building, 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 still building, building, blinking, building, finished. Go here, go to the other AVR doodles which I opened. Now I have to put it down in order to be able to press a button. Click here, press button here. And yes, so now I'm running the same sequence. You, you don't see the individual LEDs blinking any, even uh, anymore, um, but the motor is actually turning now. And uh, the, well, it, it, the positive thing with these motors is that you can very accurately position them, but it's an open loop system. There's no feedback unlike the servo motor so you don't get any signal back from the motor where it currently is and if you stop it like this now then actually it will go through the sequence the computer doesn't have any or the microcontroller doesn't know that it was stopped and uh, then actually uh, you lose the control of the position in a 3d printer you have endpoint switches which are there to actually tell the microcontroller controlling the 3d printer when the motor reaches the end position in order to recalibrate um, the position where it is. So this was everything for today. As I said, um, since there is no official time slot tomorrow and on Friday, I will send out a time when I will be available on Zoom, um, presumably on Friday afternoon but perhaps uh, on uh, tomorrow afternoon, depending on um, others. But otherwise we will have the Q&A sessions for this lab next week. And uh, if we don't see, if I don't see you, if you don't see me, it's already now that I wish you a, a nice weekend and uh, good luck with the project work. So thank you for today. I will put up this uh, video in a second on YouTube as usual as well and then also link to Studium, li link from Studium to YouTube. Okay, thank you, bye!